Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Advocacy and the Role of the Seniors Advocate. My name is Annette Johns, and I'm the Associate Director of Policy and Practice with the Newfoundland and Labrador College of Social Workers. And I will be your moderator for this continuing professional education session this morning. The webinar presentation will be approximately 60 to 70 minutes, followed by a question and answer period. During the presentation, I encourage you to type in your questions using the question mark icon at the left of your screen at any time throughout the presentation, and I'll begin asking the questions at the end of the presentation. The Office of the Seniors Advocate Newfoundland and Labrador was created in late 2017, and its opening was celebrated amongst the social work profession. I'm so excited that the Seniors Advocate, Susan Walsh, is joining us this morning to talk about the work of the office and issues impacting on seniors in our province. While Susan's full bio is available on the webinar platform, I would like to say a few introductory remarks before handing things over to Susan. Susan is a registered social worker here in Newfoundland and Labrador. With a bachelor and a master of social work, Susan has worked as a frontline social worker and spent 31 years in progressive leadership positions within numerous departments with the Newfoundland and Labrador provincial government, focused on mental health, geriatrics, disabilities, child welfare, income support, Indigenous services, municipal affairs, and executive council. Prior to her appointment as the Seniors Advocate for the province, Susan held the portfolio of Deputy Minister with the Department of Children, Seniors and Social Development. Susan, I'm really looking forward to your presentation this morning and I'm now gonna hand the virtual podium over to you. Thank you, Annette, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for your interest in attending today and hearing a little bit about my new office, <laughs> new to me <laughs> at any rate. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I think that um, social work profession is so key to the work we do in this office. And so um, I've, I've met with numerous uh, groups, uh, nursing association, uh, numerous groups, but th this one's near and dear to my heart. So I'm, I'm happy to be here this morning and speak to all of you. Um, so I'll just tell you that the structure of the interview is such that um, we'll go through um, the role of the seniors advocates or our office, the demographics, advocacy in general, some discussion about advocacy, advocacy in action, advocacy and your professional practice, and then questions and answers. And so um, I'm hoping that what this will do is give you a good outline of what we do as an office and how we do it and why it's important. And so um, by the end of all this, there will certainly be opportunity for uh, some discussion and I look forward to uh, taking your questions. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, so as it relates to what is the role of the seniors advocate? Our, our office, as Annette indicated, was established in 2017 through a piece of legislation called the Seniors Advocate Act, but it really came into force in 2018. So we're not an old office. You know, we're, one, we're the newest of the statutory offices of the House of Assembly. Just as an overview, before I go specifically into the um, Seniors Advocate uh, Act and our role and duties in this province, I'll just tell you that um, we are only one of three provinces in the country who have a Seniors Advocate. The first Seniors Advocate was um, created in British Columbia um, over 10 years ago, and our um, legislation is very similar to theirs and but yet there are differences and, and we'll talk a little bit about that and then there's a uh, seniors advocate in in new brunswick as well and manitoba is in the process of establishing a um, seniors advocate and there are a number of western provinces that are actually exploring uh, this as an option so what i think would be interesting um is that um, for you folks to, to hear about is the differences between the offices because there are some significant differences. For example, in British Columbia, the seniors advocate um, is a government employee, reports through the Department of Health and Community Services to the Minister of 
health, uh, you know, that ministry. Um, now they are independent in that um, they are able to make recommendations and, and publicly speak, but um, they do report up through the um, the government system. And so it is a little bit of a different scenario because having spent a long time inside of government, normally uh, it's the minister who speaks on behalf of the department or, you know, with authority from the minister, someone can speak. But in this case, the senior advocate is empowered to speak publicly, um, uh, but doesn't have the independence that a statutory office reporting through the House of Assembly would have. In New Brunswick, the model is completely different uh, in that New Brunswick has a, a child, youth and seniors advocate. So it's one position between the three, you know, children and youth and then um, seniors. And um, they're similar to us in that they have legislation that enables them to report directly into the House of Assembly and consequently they are not government, the advocate is not a government employee and uh, has no uh, fetters, you know, nothing's preventing uh, him in this case to speak um, publicly. Um, which is similar to our legislation in that the Seniors Advocate Legislation in Newfoundland and Labrador, I actually report to the Speaker of the House of Assembly. I'm a statutory officer of the House of Assembly. I'm no longer a government employee and I can uh, speak publicly on matters pertaining to, uh, you know, whatever I wish uh, without any um, without any uh, requirement for approval in advance or any of those kind of things. Um, in addition, the three-party system in Newfoundland and Labrador voted on who would be appointed to this position. Um, and the three-party position is also the process for having me removed, which would be different than say out in BC, uh, whereby it's a government employee, uh, but would be similar to New Brunswick. Um, the I'll just comment on the New Brunswick difference in that the child, youth and seniors advocate is all in one position. And having met with and spoke with uh, the advocate there numerous times, Kelly Lamrock, he is very clear that a little less than one third of his time uh, is spent on the seniors issues. His priority really becomes more about the children and youth, even though there are more seniors uh, similar to our province, uh, by just by nature of, of the issues. And so uh, as a consequence, I truly believe we have the best structure in Newfoundland and Labrador, which I think is very important given um, the population in this province, which we'll get into shortly. Um, the um, Perhaps one of the most important differences from my perspective is that we are a very small statutory office. We have four employees, which includes myself and an administrative support. So it's two other positions are the advocacy consultants. Um, the other offices are significantly larger. I won't bother you with the details, but uh, over double, in some cases triple. The other issue that I think is important to point out is that my office, and we'll get into this in a minute, does systemic advocacy, um, where and similar to New Br to uh, British Columbia, but New Brunswick actually does individual advocacy and can do investigations, which would be similar to what you're probably familiar with here with the child and youth advocate. So there are some significant differences. Um, last thing I just comment on is that the authority for all of our offices is at a provincial level. So, you know, we can make recommendations and impact at a provincial level. We don't have authority at a national level. That is not to say we don't work collaboratively to have impact at national level. And we regularly uh, meet with the uh, National Minister for Seniors um, and numerous other federal uh, organizations um, to have input into what seniors across this country are saying and what they need to help inform uh, national uh, policy and programs. So to jump specifically now into um, the Office of the Seniors Advocate 
in Newfoundland and Labrador and our legislation. So the act is called Newfoundland and Labrador Seniors Advocate Act. And there's really three primary uh, pieces in this in terms of what my role as an advocate is. It's to identify, review and analyze systemic issues um, related to seniors. And so, as I said earlier, it's systemic advocacy. So we don't, um, we don't do we we don't have the authority nor the resources to do individual advocacy. So we will receive many, many requests individually uh, from an advocacy perspective. Uh, Last year we were averaging, last fiscal we were averaging about 80, a little over 80 um, requests for advocacy a month. Um, this past six months it's kind of reduced, which has been helpful, uh, to a little over 60 a month. So that's a, it's a massive uh, number uh, with the size office we have, but those individual requests and, and contacts um, we can't deal with each one of them individually. We will do our best to help uh, the person connect to a service uh, program, provide them information, but we always collect the information such that once we receive enough information that, oh, this seems to be affecting many seniors, now we can say, okay, that's a systemic issue and we'll move uh, into um, our role as a systemic advocacy office. The other piece we certainly do is we work collaboratively with seniors organizations, service providers, and anyone out there in the system that's doing work in the area of seniors, uh, whereby there's overlap in terms of uh, their work and our mandate and to try to improve uh, the uh, the requirements and services for seniors. And then the last thing we can do is certainly make recommendations to government, government agencies, and it's actually broader than that, and I'll, I'll speak to that on the next slide, uh, respecting improvements to senior services. And senior services are actually defined in our legislation and further defined in our regulations. And how I like to um, say is it's basically any service that a senior would need or, or receive. So housing, transportation, a health service, it's very broad um, and uh, as it should be. So then what are my powers and duties? And I won't go through each one of these individually, but you know, we've already talked about being able to review matters and do research on, on issues to determine what seniors need. Um, I, I will call attention to D, which says, you know, we can consult seniors, service providers, and the public because that's a huge piece of the work we do. And I'm going to talk about that later, a huge public engagement process that we uh, led um, a little over a year ago now. We can also make requests for information. And though while we don't have investigatory powers, we are able to access the information that we, we require for the most part. So if, um, if an organization, a government agency, et cetera, has information in their control that is not personal health information, any other information, we have the legislative authority to receive that and, and access that and, and receive that information. And should there be any problem with that, we have authority then to uh, take that further uh, to uh, exercise our rights to have access to the information. Um, and then F, is the piece I want to talk to you about the previous slides, you know, talks about, okay, we make recommendations to government and government uh, agencies, which we do for the most part, but we also do have authority to make recommendations to service providers, to community groups. It's very broad and it's on many areas, on legislation, policy programs, and services impacting seniors. So the mandate is very expansive and so is the authority uh, to make change, but, it, but at that systemic level. And of course, our role around education and and awareness is something that we we work regularly and constantly on. Uh, I, I try my best to be uh, as uh, out there as I can, so because it's a way for people to hear what we're doing and hold us to be accountable to seniors, which is really important to me. So. Everyone says the word seniors. Some people don't like the word seniors. Some people like, you know, older individuals, etc. I mean, at the end of the day, our legislation says senior, and that's why we use that terminology. Our legislation is clear that senior means a, an individual who's 65 years of, of age or older. So that's our primary. However, it can also be a person who's less than 65 years, but receiving a senior service. And you recall, I talked about the definition 
definition of senior service is in our legislation and it's very broad. And so really, you know, if you have a person under 65 who's receiving a health service, a transportation service, a housing service, any of those things, they could potentially come under our legislation. And so we generally say that we represent seniors and or people in the province who are 50 plus. And, and that certainly does play itself out in, in, our, um, in our data around the contact we get at the office. I would suggest that the majority of it is 65 plus, but we do certainly get a lot of under 65. And of course, definition there of systemic, which um, you know is really about trying to have the greatest change by issues that are impacting the most people. So why why a seniors advocate? Why would we need a seniors advocate in this province? Well, I think there's many reasons, but the one that I you know, truly uh, think is telling is our demographics. And so um, I'd like to walk us through a little poll, if uh, folks don't mind. I'm interested in your thoughts on what is the percentage of the population in this province that would you would think would be over the age of 50? over the age of 50? Is it 25%? Is it 35%? Is it 45%? So I'm just going to give you a few minutes to, uh, you know, do the poll if you don't mind. I'm, I'm curious, uh, I'm curious your thoughts on that. And once we get the results, I will share them with you. It's always telling. There's a really uh, interesting um, dynamic that goes on, I find, when we talk about the data. So I'll just give it one more second. We've got a little bit of uh, response. Anybody else out there who's waiting to push the button, go for it. <laughs> there we go. I'll go with that. So I'm going to... Uh, push the results out to all you folks. You're a very well-informed group, <laughs> no surprise. So you'll see there that um, the that uh, the responses, 83% of the responses said 45% of people in the province are 50 plus. And that, and that is exactly right. Um, you'll see here that 47.1% of people in the province, as of September 22nd, um were over the age of 50 and that's only going to increase over the years um and that's that's really telling because um I, as i said to you people under the age of 65 can receive service through our our um, office and uh, you know basically as a consequence we say we serve as practically half the province in terms of uh, the needs of uh, older adults and seniors in this province now if you you know really look at this in terms of our di of our planning as a province, as a pro as programs and services that you folks work on and deliver, it is really important because what it says is, so yeah, the 53% uh, is under 50, but only 18% is under 19 years of age. So, you know, we really are a, an aging population in Newfoundland and Labrador. We all know that. We are the fastest growing seniors uh, population in the country uh, per capita. And we're also the oldest in the country. And let me move to that. So if you look at the uh, individual 65 plus, um, in Canada, StatsCan is, is uh, projecting that by 2068, one in four people will be the age of 65 plus. Well, we're already there. As a province, we are already there. And the um, Stats Canada also projects that by 2043, 23.1% of the, of the uh, country will be 65 plus. Well, by that point, 32% in this province will be um, 65 plus. So we know that this means that we really have to focus in on the policy programs and legislative considerations uh, at all levels to ensure that we meet the needs currently of the seniors in, in our population, but as well planning for um, the growing number and especially the growing number of older um, 
uh, seniors in the province. So that's a little bit about my office. It's a little bit about um, the demographics of our province. I'd like to move into some information about advocacy and and what we as a um, what we as an office do, and then a little bit about potentially your role uh, in advocacy. And so, the World Health Organization certainly uh, talks a lot about advocacy and its importance in terms of influencing change. And they've identified there are three types of advocacy. This not this none of this is going to be uh, un, unfamiliar to you folks. We know that there's self advocacy. So you know, uh, as social workers, we often uh, you know work very hard to help people advocate for themselves. We know that's empowering. We know that uh, that's the approach we'd like to see that people feel empowered to to you know, make the change for themselves. And we certainly, as an office, uh, we approach it from that perspective as well. Um, you know, we will provide information to to seniors. We'll help them with the tools that they need to, you know, do what they can do to access the services and programs they require. Um, as I said, you know, we're we're averaging at this point a little over sixty requests a month. So you can imagine we do a lot of work with individuals around helping them to um, access the services and supports they need to get the help that they're looking for, um, all through helping them advocate for themselves. But we also know, you know, it is really difficult sometimes to advocate for yourself, especially when you don't know what the supports and services are, when, you know, it means you have to have the ability to communicate and communicate well. You have to have the resources and support sometimes to be able to access uh, the people that you need to contact, which is often difficult. And you have to be fairly assertive and confident and, and know your rights. And so this can all be really challenging sometimes for any of us. And certainly, um, you know, we hear that sometimes from seniors. And so we hear often that seniors say, well, no one listens to me. No one, you know, is paying attention, those kind of things that I don't have a voice. From an individual advocacy perspective, we um, we know that there are many community organizations out there advocating for individual uh, seniors, and you know, kudos to them. And we do whatever we can to support them and work with them. And, and I've got lots of examples we could go through where we do that. Um, and you know, of course, sometimes it's um, organizations that are helping um, seniors, and then sometimes it's uh, it's just family, and I don't mean to say just, that's the wrong word. It's 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 family members who are, you know, doing their best to help their loved one uh, get the resources and supports they need. And that's really important, too, because obviously the more help and support a person has around them, um, either helping them to do it themselves or helping them with it, uh, it makes certainly such a difference uh, from their, uh, you know, health and well-being perspective. We don't do this individual advocacy as an office. We cannot. We don't have the legal authority and we don't have the resources to do it. Um, our, as I said, mandate is specific to either empowering seniors to help them self-advocate or systemic advocacy. And that's really our bread and butter. So, you know, our, our role here is we identify a problem that's impacting a number of seniors and we work to move the dial forward to create the programs, policies, uh, the answer that is required to meet the need of the senior. Um, and so where we can best have our impact is where we can impact the policies and programs and services at that you know, macro level. Um, because we acknowledge that there are numerous structural factors that can often impact individuals at that individual level. So if we can have that change at a systemic level with the resources we have as a small office, we find that that has the greatest impact um, across the board. Um, and again, we certainly, I couldn't acknowledge more the impact of many community organizations out there doing systemic advocacy as well. Um, and, you know, we've partnered with many to help move the dial forward on things. I mean, most recently with, uh, just give you the example on, on the housing front, I mean, we worked with uh, end homelessness, 
uh, and many other organizations. Uh, my gosh, I could go through them all. There's so many of them. Uh, seven or eight other organizations to bring the attention to government on homelessness for for all individuals in the province, uh, and specifically the significant uh, impact it's. Uh, uh, higher disproportional impact it's having on seniors only because it's seniors struggle so much with how to access the system to get housing so they may not have a phone if they have a phone it could be a flip phone so they're not on social media to you know be on facebook marketplace to find out when there's a vacancy those kind of things so you know that's just many organizations doing systemic work we we partner sometimes that brings a, a, a level of uh, oomph to it that uh, as a consequence uh, creates a situation where um, it, it, it may help elevate it and so in this case we did write the premier we very clearly called for an all-party committee to address the crises um, and while they haven't created an all-party committee they did subsequently create the task force. And so we'll see how that uh, plays itself out. So um, perhaps the biggest though difference that may be, be helpful for me to lay out is that between us as systemic advocacy, the, you know, the role of a seniors advocate as a systemic advocate versus community organizations is that we are grounded in legislation. So we have the legislative authority to represent seniors on issues, to access information required to get the data and information required to make those recommendations and we can make those recommendations and by virtue of that being our legislative authority we're protected to speak out there's no uh, repercussion uh, will come to me by virtue of the fact that i'm doing my job in fact i always kind of uh, joke when i meet with seniors and say if i'm not speaking publicly and being vocal on your needs and issues then i'm not doing my job even from a legislative perspective and so that's very liberating after spending uh, 32 years inside of government <laughs> okay so what tools are in the toolbox that would be helpful to um, to for you folks to hear in terms of how we um, do our work. And I thought about it and I thought, okay, well, maybe rather than just walking through, okay, we do this, we do that, I, I'll try to build it out in terms of issues and then the mechanism so that it might be a little less dry, <laughs> if nothing else. So, uh, you know, if you take the issue of ageism, so I mean, you know, discrimination on the grounds of a person's age it can be a you know, stereotype in terms of how we think about people, it's a prejudice in terms of how we feel about people, or discrimination in terms of how we act toward people. All of it can have an impact in terms of um, the access to services, a person's mental health, their physical health, um, even their finances. All of this, you know, ageism is, is significant in terms of the impact it can have on a person. And while, you know, it's not just specific to seniors, um, my focus, of course, would be on the impact it has on seniors. And so the mechanisms our office has available to us is we can do education on the impact of ageism and the things we, we as a society could be doing to, to make a change. We can do public awareness, which we do all the time. We're out, uh, you know, doing sessions and uh, meeting with folks um, and of course we use the media and we really use the media as an office I will say I mean I always uh, when I meet with seniors I always say it's the worst part of the job I spent so many years preparing a minister to speak publicly I never really realized <laughs> how stressful it can be and it is but what an avenue it has been to ensure that in a province like ours where we are so geographically sparse i mean we are spread out and we know that often uh, older adults uh, because of the vir by virtue of the home of the, of the fact they're retired and home are you know maybe listening to uh radio shows and those kind of things more um and of course you know have a keen interest in in politics and public issues so they're, they're following the media it has been a great uh, venue for uh, getting the message out on what we're doing, what we're up to, and getting their feedback as well. And so um, uh, it's become uh, it's become a real uh, way uh, as an office to to work to get our message out, especially a small office like ours. And we don't have tentacles, right? We are located in St. John's and in an office. Uh, you know, we don't have uh, offices around the province or anything like that. So that is certainly a key way. 
And so then you think about the issue of isolation and loneliness, which is so significant. And it's 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 so significant in older adults, it's so significant as a consequence of COVID. Uh, it's so, so significant because of the financial uh, challenges the seniors are facing, the lack of transportation uh, outside of St. John's uh, specifically, uh, not to say inside St. John's as well. So it's, it's, it's a massive issue. And as a consequence, um, we use things like um, how do we how do we address those kind of things? And so, in addition to the things that I've already said, we can also do things like promoting certain models uh, to all levels of government. So, you know, a specific model that uh, we certainly support is the age-friendly communities approach. And so, for example, when we go out to communities, and so we do that a lot. So, I mean, last last year we visited thirty communities and met with you know. Uh, uh, many seniors in all those communities and but we also try our best to meet with the municipal government in those areas and when we do we take the opportunity certainly to talk about how are they meeting the needs of older adults in their in their uh, uh, area and we talk about age-friendly communities often we've provided uh, research and literature around it so that you know they're really thinking broadly about if they meet the needs of older adults they're meeting the needs of all people in their community and so you know, we had a really good dialogue in one community that we're looking at bringing in a splash pad when, you know, over 60% of the residents were seniors. It was like, hmm, but you don't have a seniors club here or, you know, those kind of things. So, you know, we have, uh, that's just, you know, another way we go about it. So, and then taking, you know, what we talked about earlier, that oftentimes there's inadequate programs or services or lack of programs and services that are needed for seniors. And so we will do things like consultations and we'll get into that shortly. And we develop reports and we make recommendations um, to, to meet those, those needs. Um, and so from a policy and program development perspective, when government uh, specifically is, is developing their programs and policies, we'll often provide policy advice and expertise. So for example, um, government has a, a cabinet committee focused on seniors and it's, you know, represents numerous departments of government. And so I was invited in to meet with the cabinet committee and provide uh, my input in terms of the programs and services that are required, feedback on the current, those kind of things. And, and specifically around the health accord and health accord recommendations. So, uh, you know, we are seen as an office that can provide that kind of advice and expertise because it's grounded in uh, what seniors are telling us and the research that we do. Another example is food insecurity, and, and I talked a little bit about homelessness earlier and safety. And so we have a number of collaborations with community organizations. Uh, you know, we work uh, very collaboratively with uh, Food First NL, and uh, you know, certainly um, part of their consultation process when they were developing their uh, recent report and recommendations on food insecurity. And our most recent report actually uh, reiterates do the recommendation that Food First NL says about the delivery of, of food for older adults and people who are unable to get to a food bank. And so um, another one is around safety. So we know that uh, many seniors in this province and certainly nationally are um, at risk. And a uh, most recent issue we've been hearing about is seniors who are at risk from family members living in the home or others living in their home. but often it's a it's a it's a it's a child an adult child who may have moved in during covid uh, to help out uh, who may be having financial difficulties so had to move back home whatever it might be but we're seeing a large number you know, it's growing around the number of calls we're getting at this office that uh, organizations like seniors and l and others are receiving around seniors who don't want that person there any longer they're either being harmed or feel uh, feel that they're unsafe because they're being threatened and the adult won't move out. And so, you know, we are very involved with seniors and all in that piece and many other community organizations, police forces, et cetera. So we do a lot of that kind of collaboration. We work with researchers in the province. We're very engaged with, um, uh, uh, oh my goodness, got right out of my head. Certainly with national researchers who've reached out to us for our data, which we have not shared, uh, but also, with the Aging Research Center um, on the west coast of uh, Newfoundland and Labrador uh, to work with them on uh, the type of research that we would like to see for seniors and to help 
inform some of the research that they're doing as well. And so then accountability, I, I have to say it's a massive issue for me. When I came into this position, it was one of my key pieces. How do I ensure that I am accountable to the seniors of this province uh, to ensure that this office is making a difference for them? And uh, I always say when I meet with seniors that you pay my salary, and they do through their taxes. And so, and they are the largest taxpayers in the province. So as a consequence, I would like to be, you know, I need to be sure that I am meeting their needs. And so how do we do that? So when we came into the office, uh, when I came into the office um, a little over a year and a half ago now, I thought, okay, how are we going to ensure that level of accountability? So we started with uh, annual uh, reports on the status of our recommendations. So we make recommendations, are they being followed up on? And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, more, but that's that's one way. And of course, there are many others. Meeting with them on a regular basis, as I told you, we visited 30 communities this year, hundreds and hundreds of seniors. And I'll talk a little bit about our consultation process shortly. And of course, we're very accessible in many ways, shapes and form. We've gotten very active on our social media. And you know, some seniors are using social media, but we've also established um, an email group. So we have over 500 seniors signed up now to receive information from our office on what we're doing, on any information we receive that we think would be useful to them. Uh, they, you know, when we release a, a report, they get a first <laughs> uh, before it goes public or at least just about the same time. So it's, uh, it's a way to make sure that we're being accountable. And they email us back and they call us and they tell us when we're doing a good job or when we're doing a bad job. And that's important too. And so, uh, you know, accountability is really important. We also started a um, quarterly newsletter, which really lays out what is our office up to? What have we been doing? And always asking, you know, any feedback you have, please contact us. So that's a little bit about some of the levers, some of the mechanisms we as an office, uh, you know, advocacy office will use to try to push the dial forward, get the needs of seniors met. So I talked about the fact that, you know, our recommendations report is, is uh, one way around accountability. And I'd just like to go into that a little bit more in detail. So you'll see here that um, back in 2022, we started the process, our first report on tracking the recommendations we make and the success they've had. And so at that time, you'll see that 44% of the recommendations from our 2019 report. So the 2019 report had 25, 26 recommendations. And so at that time, 44 had been implemented over that three to four year period. 44 were being implemented, 44% was being implemented and 12 weren't touched. And so, you know, I lots of media interest at that time. And my message at the time was, it I was somewhat disappointed that it wasn't as high as I would have liked to see, but we know that COVID fell in the middle of that. And I mean, I acknowledge that service providers, I was one of them at the time, you know, it really threw a, a, a a monkey wrench into your into you know all the great uh, plans we had because you were really busy trying to address uh, how do you deliver service during COVID how do you you know keep people safe you know employees safe etc during COVID all of it and so that was you know understandable as a consequence uh, but I'm happy to say that when we released the 2023 report back this uh, past fall we saw significant change we saw the 64 now, OK, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, 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 I'm on the screen, so I don't know if we want me or if we want the, the slides, but OK, perfect. Thank you. So um, I'll keep going. Um, so, you know, I think that we've seen some significant pro progress. I think there's a real commitment. I, and I am asked that, you know, Susan, do you think anyone's listening? Do you think government's responding to your office? Yeah, I do. I do, because I think that the service providers in the system are so committed to see, making a change. And I think government, uh, and, and I'm not I'm not political. I don't care who's, you know, which political party is in. It's it's irrelevant to me. I'm, I'm, um, I report to all three parties of the House of Assembly and I'm apolitical, I don't, you know, but I think that people want to meet the needs of the citizens of the province. And when you have such a large group of um, seniors um, in the province, and, you know, as I said, they're voters, um, then I think there's a real interest in meeting their needs. Um, and so as a consequence, I, I see real positive change. And so, you know, some of the key things we saw this past year that seniors were so pleased with is uh, the driver's medicals. So our office had recommended that driver's medicals for seniors who are 75 plus that receive, that have to have a driver's medical to continue to drive be free. 
Uh, it was very much attached to the idea of age-friendly communities and aging in place and that, you know, if we keep seniors independent, uh, that is good for all sorts of reasons, uh, their health and, and not only that, but for government overall in terms of their independence. And in this province, you know, being able to drive is almost critical. Um, we're so little um, transportation. So as a, a, a government or fiscal, uh, sorry, municipal transportation. And so as a consequence, uh, we were pleased to see that and seniors are quite pleased with it. Um, we know there's a small glitch because it's only uh, if you're, you get your medical completed by a doctor. So if it's completed by uh, someone who builds you, um, it can be completed by others than a doctor, uh, but that person has to be on salary to say the health system so you know for example a nurse practitioner can, can complete the medical but if they're uh, a private in private practice it, it's not included so our message to seniors is don't do that <laughs> go to a a, a clinician who's uh, who's not going to charge you and if you have any trouble with that uh, the department of, of uh, service and now has said that they they can be contacted for options and opportunities okay the other thing that we were quite pleased to see and uh, it was reiterated our recommendation back in 2019 actually was that there be increased professionals with expertise in gerontology and that was reiterated in the health accord in fact a number of the recommendations from the 2019 report were and so we have seen that that has moved forward as well so you know it's like anything if, if you often uh, pay attention to what you track and so by f virtue of the fact that we we now have an annual uh, process whereby we're tracking recommendations i think that'll be important and we'll see we'll hope to see progress and where we don't see progress that'll be our role as well to step in and say well why isn't there so overall the the most significant impact that we as an advocacy office at a systemic level can have is to influence uh, public policy. And I mean, as you folks would know, I mean, public policy is policy that's established uh, by government. Um, we, we feel that, um, that if we wish to impact policy at, a, at, a, you know, at that level, we do though need to be collecting the needs of seniors at that individual level. And that's why it's a little bit of a dichotomy for us. And it's challenging when you're a small office because we do need to collect up all these, um, you know, what's happening for seniors and what their needs are and what's not being met and roll it up into that systemic picture and then make that uh, make those recommendations for, for public policy change. And so then, wow, how do you do that when there's, you know, uh, 50% of the province, you know, 250,000 people basically who could be people who might wish to have a say here, certainly 125,000 minimally who do because they're 65 plus. And so then how, how do we do that? Now, I'll get, I'm going to walk you through one example of how, how we've done it, how we've tried to do that uh, piece and make it manageable. And it's through a full public engagement process that our office uh, led back in 2022. Actually, led into 2023. We started in 2022 and led into 2023. And it was remarkable, actually. A lot of people said, oh, my goodness, Susan, you're going to do an online survey. An online survey. These are seniors. Are you going to get the response rate? Are you going to get the input? And we said, well, we're also going to do engagement sessions. And so we held 15 uh, in-person engagement sessions throughout the province and two online engagement sessions. And thanks to our partners, we were able to get those uh, uh, accessible as well, those uh, engagement sessions, because uh, we didn't have the money in this office to pay for it. Uh, but uh, uh, Seniors and Al certainly stepped up and they provided uh, funding for us uh, to get those to be um, uh, uh, to have ASL available. And so as a result, um, we heard from almost 400 seniors through our public engagement sessions. But we also did the online survey and it was a remarkable and surprising response. We heard from over a thousand people to our online survey. And I have to say, I talked about the role of media and the importance it has in terms of advocacy. And I truly do uh, you know, say that uh, I think 
the media really played an important role in helping to advertise this. And every chance I got, I went public to talk about it and ask people to go online. And please, you know, if you can't do it yourself, ask a family member or a friend to assist you. We also helped out here in terms of we mailed them out. We received them back and inputted them. We, we would take calls here and people would say, I don't have a computer. I don't have whatever. It doesn't matter. We'll fill it out for you here. We'll ask you the questions. We'll fill it out. And so we did a whole lot to get that. Uh, it was over a thousand responses. And in fact, uh, just under, just over 900 of them were seniors themselves. And then we had service providers and family members uh, respond as well. And you can see there, we had 913 seniors themselves that applied. So, and, and 1,087 responses. I have, um, I have researchers across the country contacting me, asking me how we did it and could they get access to the data, which we are not giving them. At any rate, it tells you seniors want to have a voice in this province, which I think many may have thought, well, they're not as vocal as you know they could or should be. No, no, they want a voice. And so in actual fact, because of the size of the sample, the margin of error rate is plus or minus 3.2%, which is at the 95th confidence interval. And so basically, while I can't say it represents the entire province, it's you know, representative because we didn't randomly sample, it's as close as you're going to get to it. The a, a little bit of information about, well, who do we hear from? I mean, we had a nice, uh, you know, gender dis you know, the distribution in terms of male, female, we had, uh, you know, not to be, uh, you know, unexpected, we had the majority of our respondents from St. John's Metro, as would be the same with the population of the province, but we had a large outside the Avalon, uh, outside St. John's, I'm sorry, on the Avalon, and we had Central, Western, and Labrador fairly well represented when you look at the population. And so as a consequence, which we haven't, I mean, that's the piece this office really, uh, you know, we haven't got into, is it actually in line with the population statistics? But it's, we know it's, it's, uh, it's very good. Um, and so as a consequence, the other thing I'll bring your attention to is we had the income distribution. So we had, um, you know, we had people who um, were under the 30,000 a year respond to the survey, right up to over a thousand, a hundred thousand, I'm sorry. So we had a good s selection of, of income and we also got what we would have expected in terms of our age categories. So we had, you know, a small group of 50 to, to 60, we had more 60 to 65, and then our age group, you know, our primary mandate, the 65 plus, and, and, and we were surprised that we got a fairly good selection of 80 plus. Um, what did we hear? Well, no one would be surprised that we heard that access to primary health care was so significantly uh, challenging for seniors in this province. And I, and I do mean primary health care. Like they just can't get into a doctor. When they get in, they're told they can only speak to one, maybe two issues. Um, yet, you know, they've got four or five collected up since, you know, they, they've been waiting to get in. And, you know, that third issue or fourth issue might be what's impacting the first two. You know, all these issues around access to primary health care. Probably what was somewhat surprising, truthfully, was that people equaled the importance to them, what they felt was you know, significant in terms of a priority of healthcare to the cost of living. And so, you know, many people in this province had a vision that seniors are doing okay because they get the GIS, they get the OAS, you know, they get the CPP, you know, they've got, they've got their federal pensions, you know, generally speaking, so they're doing okay. But, and I, it was somewhat surprising that the cost of living became an issue, even for us as an office, because when we did our in-person sessions, we didn't hear a lot about the cost of living. It was through the survey that it came out equally important as health. And what I'll say to you is that you, I know you folks wouldn't be surprised by that because in person people, you know, they're there with their neighbors, with their community and group, you know, everybody who knows each other. And they didn't want to talk about the fact they couldn't afford to pay their bills. But when they went online and it was all anonymous, well, you know, you, you, you feel a little more confidence in terms of being able to say, uh, you know, what's... Uh, what's really important to you without being stigmatized. And so 
I'll just walk through some of the highlights in terms of what we heard and some of the things we've been doing as an office. And I'm recognizing time. I won't go into a lot of detail, but just to give you some sense of. So I talked about the fact from a healthcare perspective um, that, you know, that whole piece around access to primary health care and financial concerns were equal. And the access to primary health care was certainly related to a GP or a uh, nurse practitioner. People didn't, there, it, it was helpful for us to hear that seniors did not feel that uh, it always had to be a GP. They were very pleased, in fact, exceptionally, in most cases, pleased with the service they've been providing been provided by nurse practitioners from a holistic perspective. Uh, the challenge was in some cases they were having to pay for that and they couldn't afford it. And of course, um, uh, long-term care and was overwhelming, the discussion on long-term care and the stories. And it was, you know, I, some of you may have heard me in the media. It was gut-wrenching to hear some of these stories. It was, uh, it was just so, so disgusting. Um, the, the level of care that I'll call it care, whatever that seniors were receiving, um, and and uh, you know was mostly the adult children of these of these seniors talking about the treatment that uh, that their loved one was receiving, and so in response to that, um, I went public uh, in the fall. I couldn't even finish the consultations; it was just too glaring and too too significant. I went public to say, look, we had already put out a recommendation in 2019. We knew the uh, long-term care and personal care home systems were broken. They were concerning and uh, they needed a review. And uh, so then I reiterated that call and asked for an immediate external review of the system by experts in that area. And so I'm pleased to say that the Department of Health and Community Services did step up and uh, began that process. Um, and that's ongoing. Um, we also um, heard a lot about home support, uh, you know, hard to access it when you get it, it doesn't meet the needs, the requirement around, uh, you have to have a personal care need to get home support is a challenge. I heard from many seniors who said, listen, I could still be in my own home, but I, you know, I, I'm an older gentleman, I never had to cook a meal in my life, and my wife was a stay at home, you know, that's just the generation I was, or, you know, I um, I can't keep my, the cleaning of my house up, I just can't, I, you know, I, I'm healthy enough that, you know, I don't feel I need to be in a personal care home, but, you know, I can't get down and clean up the floors, and, you know, it was all adding up, and so, uh, you know, it was really unfortunate from a aging at home perspective. Uh, we heard a lot about that. And so, you know, I, I've just listed there's some of the initiatives of the office in response to some of the things we heard. Um, I'm, I don't think in the interest of time, I'm going to go through each of these, uh, but you know, you can certainly read through them and I'm, I'm happy if uh, Annette wants to share the slides later. Uh, in addition, we, we uh, a lot of what we heard was about housing. And in the consultations in person, we heard a lot about people who wanted to age in place. We always ask the question, you know, where do you wish to transpire, <laughs> right? And we'd have a little joke about it, and 95% of the hands would go up to say, I want to, you know, I want to live in my own home till I, you know, pass on. Um, but there was always challenges with, uh, oh, these are older homes, how can I afford to keep them heated? How can I afford the general maintenance? I mean, the stories we'd hear about uh, people, one lady told a story about uh, $250 to get three nails in her ease trough. Uh, you know, I hope whoever charged for that has what, what they should have coming to them at some point in life. Uh, you know, it was just disgusting, some of the stories. And we heard a lot about younger seniors supporting the older seniors. Well, do you have anyone to come and uh, shovel your driveway, uh, you know, mow your lawn? Oh, yeah, my friend down the road, you know, he's only 65 or he's only 70, 75. He comes up and does it. Uh, you know, we are we are a system that's built on hoping our neighbors and family and friends are going to take care of us in these homes because in the community because there's precious little in the way of other resources and so we certainly heard a lot about that and uh, as i said you know again you know uh, i won't go into all the things we're doing as a consequence but we certainly are doing a lot of community collaboration around programs and services we we are requesting government have a response in terms of programs and service expansion of the home uh, maintenance program and uh, we talk with municipalities around what are you doing to support seniors in your community? Um, and we are taking a focus and, you know, certainly talk a little bit about that. 
uh, around what what needs to change, what do we need to be doing, and we've been doing some research around uh, best practice approaches around community uh, support for seniors. Then the third area was transportation and certainly the expense and affordability of it. I mean, I could spend a whole session talking to you about what we heard from seniors throughout the province uh, who have very little in the way of access to transportation, that it's impacted by uh, poor traveling conditions, that if they don't have a family or friend and they hate to be dependent on family and friend, and they, you know, it's a, it's a financial strain because their family and friends also can't afford to drive them to, you know, medical appointments and those kind of things. So then they have to pay them to do it. Um, um, the MTAP program, medical transportation assistance program, is not adequate uh, to meet their needs. We've made certainly made our, so our office a call for that program to be re reviewed back in 2019. It is still under review, uh, though we are seeing in this past year a number of changes uh, to, to improvements. To it. we're happy to see that, um, and we've you know we've made some recommendations that uh, that we think would strengthen it. Uh, really think that that's a key element to helping seniors age in their communities. Um, Plus, of course, then we address other needs for uh, at numerous levels, uh, federally and provincially, uh, beyond the MTEP program. There are other mechanisms out there that could help uh, meet the needs of seniors. And so, you know, we know, for example, the provincial government uh, has a community transportation program. We know it's oversubscribed. Uh, they never have enough money in the budget to meet the need. Uh, and I know this past year, I mean, we'd, we'd had a lot of dialogue with uh, numerous ministers and, uh, and I so pleased uh, that uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs took us up on what we were suggesting around increasing uh, that program and, and programs to help uh, community organizations um, have more funding to meet the needs of seniors. And so we saw first time ever, and it's one time, but a lot of money put into that program. So we hope to see that to continue and to, we'll certainly be watching for it. And then, um, from a cost of living perspective, uh, you know, we certainly, um, we were not surprised that every age group, everybody in this province is being impacted by the increased cost of living um, and, and inflation. That's definitely accurate. However, we were somewhat surprised at the um, degree of which impact it's having on seniors specifically. And so I'll go into more detail that in a minute, but some of the things we as an office have tried to do, we, we did our first ever budget submission as an office uh, last year uh, when, federal, when the provincial government was developing their uh, uh, budget process. We, we fed into that with the documents online on our website. We obviously put out recommendations. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, we've met with the federal minister. I mean, one of the things we heard from uh, many income uh, low-income seniors, uh, we met with a group at the gathering place, and they said, look, if we could get our, our monthly check to be bi-weekly, what a difference that would make to us in terms of planning, uh, you know, budgeting for the month. And I thought, my God, yes, sure. If I got my check every two weeks or every month, I'd be challenged. And you're getting it once a month. It's like such an easy, simple fix. So we've met with the previous minister of seniors uh, for, uh, federally and the uh, current one and brought that to their attention. I mean, it's an easy fix. Uh, so we're we're hoping to see that. I don't have authority at the national level. I already said that uh, in terms of my mandate, but we certainly do our best to try to have an impact where, where we can. So just specifically taking the cost of living. So we did this full consultation process. We heard from so many seniors. We heard uh, we went through an exercise with them when, when with the in session uh, in in person sessions and said we're giving you three stickers put out what you feel is the most important to you and we really didn't know seniors were going to take us up on it you can put one sticker i mean many of you would have been through this exercise right one sticker after we got all the session finished and we've taken pages and pages of feedback and have stuck all over the wall. One sticker on what's important, one thing that's important to you, I put three of them there, or you can put one on three different things, your call. And so we did that and many seniors would come up to us afterwards, I didn't get my stickers or, you know, asking questions about it, but they really engaged. And uh, so between healthcare and cost of living being equal, we decided we would focus initially as an office on cost of living. We were very honest with seniors when we did this process and we said to them, we are three people you know, with administrative support, clerical support. So, you know, we will not be able to take everything on the one time. We just don't have the resources. But 
you know, we will pick away at each one as we can and moving forward, the dial forward. And so we started with cost of living. And so as you'll see here, the feedback we received is that one third of seniors reported they did not have enough income to meet their financial needs. And three quarters of them said that they knew between themselves not having or knowing a senior who didn't have enough income to meet their financial needs. Um, that was significant. And, you know, if I bring your attention back to the income sources here, right, that we heard from, only 15, 14 actually, percent of the seniors we heard from received the guaranteed income supplement. So what that means is the lowest income seniors in this province received the GIS. Only 14% of our respondents were receiving the GIS, yet 32% didn't have the resources they need needed to pay their bills. And so what does that tell you? It tells you that those federal benefits are not adequate. They are not uh, enough for people to live on, nor is the provincial benefit um, in terms of the um, senior supplement. It's just not enough money. They can't afford to live. And so if you dig into that uh, a little further, what are the impacts of not having enough income? Well, seniors report, so if you just dig into that 32% who said they didn't have enough income to meet their financial needs, they said things like they can't afford, 40% of them said they can't afford to eat. They certainly couldn't afford to eat healthy. And so, for example, you know, if they had, were diabetics, they couldn't afford to buy the food they needed. They couldn't afford their utilities. They couldn't afford social events. And while, you know, some people might buy, not this group certainly, uh, but some people would balk at that. Well, Susan, why are you talking about social events? Well, because it keeps them active and healthy and their well-being, uh, you know, is is continuing to be positive. Um, you know, it's just, it, it was, it was, we were hearing stories of seniors who were cutting their pills in half to make them go farther, uh, who were not filling their prescriptions, who needed uh, medical devices like canes or walkers, couldn't afford to get them. It was horrendous and somewhat surprising in that because the federal programs, the OAS and GIS, are indexed to inflation, the idea is there's a view to the world, seniors are okay because you always keep them ahead of the rate of inflation but because the cost of living has so significantly increased and specifically in this province which is something i certainly talked to the federal minister about specifically in this province we don't we have many seniors who got to go to a corner store to buy their groceries because they can't afford to drive an hour an hour and a half or pay someone to drive them an hour an hour and a half to a grocery store to buy in bulk well they wouldn't buy in bulk because only one individual but to buy at that lower cost we're hearing about grocery stores who are up in their cost when the checks or their the cost of uh, of their items when the checks come in and then two weeks later are decreasing the costs when uh, you know they don't have any money left to buy their groceries. So there's lots of things happening. So what did we as an office do? I talked earlier about the fact that, okay, we can make recommendations. So we so bring this full circle now to, to this, what I was saying is a process we follow. So we did, we have the authority on our legislation to consult seniors. We did a full consultation process. We had the authority to go out publicly and speak about the needs we did that. We did many, many media interviews. We did, uh, you know, many, uh, uh, lots of different organizations invited us to come and speak, etc. And so then we developed our report, What Golden Years, and we specifically decided that we would focus in on recommendations from a financial perspective. Is it the panacea? No, it is not. It's a place to start. I'm still excited to see and hopeful we will see the poverty reduction plan for seniors um, because that is really what we need. These are just some little elements that will help get us through the process, through the hump until we can get to the place of having a full on poverty reduction plan. So that's one example of how we as an advocacy organization, a systemic level, you know, that's a that, that's kind of like the process overall and the end product we came out with. And as I talked to you earlier, uh, we said, you know, we will track our recommendations annually. So those recommendations we were tracking uh, this past fall, we will now add our current recommendations to that list and we'll be tracking in terms of how... Uh, how that's moving along in the system and are they being met. And then we'll report publicly on it. And when we meet with organizations, we meet with seniors, we'll tell them, we'll say, yep, that's moving and we're pleased to see government's done it. Or you know what, there's been no traction and we're not pleased. And you know, this is what we're doing to try to help that DOM move forward. So I, 
we try to be as impartial and fair as an office as we possibly can be and we'll give lots of uh, kudos when we see positive and then you know when we have called something out we do and that's that's our role as a, in my role certainly as an advocate as a seniors advocate okay so what's your role as a seniors as an advocate not necessarily with seniors with any organ with any uh, age group or or persons um and i i thought we might um ask another little poll question here so within your practice whatever organization you're with or group uh, whoever you may serve in terms of uh, you're not seeing my air quotes client do you feel you're able to advocate for your clients simple yes or no i'm, I'm just interested in in uh, what what are your thoughts do you feel you can advocate for your client So we'll give it a few minutes for people to uh, think about that and and uh, respond. We're nearing the end of the presentation. You'll be pleased to know. So uh, I know we're. Uh, I want to make sure we have uh, adequate time there for questions. Some responses. Give it a few more seconds. We're going up. <laughs> One more second. Do you feel that you have the ability to advocate for your client? Okay, so I'll push out the results. So I am pleased to see the response. Um, Oh, there we go, pushed, because the response says that, yes, the majority of you folks feel you can advocate for your client. Well, I am really pleased to hear that. I can't tell you how much, um, because I hear differently. I hear sometimes people say that, uh, you know, I'm working within a government system, uh, whether that be the healthcare system or direct government, and, uh, you know, it's frowned upon, or I, I don't feel I can, or, you know, I've not been told specifically, but there seems to be a feeling like, uh, that's not your role, right? There are policies and programs, you have to follow them, you have to explain to your client what they are, and that's that. Um, and I, I will be perfectly honest, we hear a lot from seniors who will say to us, I really thought the social worker would be my advocate. I really thought that she, in most cases, uh, would, you know, help me, you know, move forward what I need within, oftentimes it's within, you know, the healthcare system, uh, but it's, it's certainly broader than that. And, you know, I went into the meeting and they didn't represent me well, or, you know, they didn't say anything. And I felt like I was alone in it. I didn't get the support I needed. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I find that challenging as a social worker myself, and I and I and I personally know, having worked, um, you know, uh, as frontline social worker and frontline manager, right up through, you know, director, policy, etc., and, and deputy minister, I, I I do believe you can advocate within a government structure and system. Obviously, you can't go public like we are doing on a regular basis. That's not your, your role. But you can bring to the attention of your organization the needs of seniors and, and the problem and, or whatever age group and where you see there are you know, impediments and where you feel a positive change could be made. And so, you know, when you look at our code of ethics specifically, and our new code of ethics really has a, a nice uh, focus on promoting social justice uh, for people, um, that's to ensure that they receive fair and equitable services and you know benefits and opportunities and those kind of things. Um, I do think that uh, we are challenged <laughs> to ensure that as social workers that we are advocating for our clients. Um, and so, you know, if you look at the, I just pulled out just three specific areas within that social uh, justice uh, uh, area and, you know, it talks about access to services, it talks about changing organizational policies and, and practice. And while you might not have the authority to change the policy and practice, you are the experts because you're seeing where the problems are and you can share that experience forward um i, I 
anybody who's ever worked with me knows I always say that good policy only catches up with great practice. And that, for the most part, has been my experience. I mean, there's good people out there doing great work to meet the needs of their clients, <laughs> again, air quotes, and you know, trying to find those loopholes and gray areas and, and sharing that forward to say, like, you know, we really could use a change here. Now, at the end of the day, sometimes uh, that systemic change is is completely outside of your control and you've you've done your best to share what you feel, uh, you know, could make a difference and is needed. Um, and that's where offices like mine can come in. You know, we're always open to hearing from service providers. Um, we don't share your information. You can you know, remain anonymous in terms of, uh, you know, anything that you're seeing that you think is an issue for seniors and that uh, should change and, and needs to change and would make a difference. And so we're always certainly open to that. Um, we also, of course, have our standards of practice in this province. And standards of practice, again, talk about, um, you know, the inherent dignity and worth of all people and the role social workers play. And I'll just pull you, your attention specifically to be there where you know we talk about making reasonable efforts to advocate for policies and programs that support the health and well-being of clients and are informed by social determinants of health and and i do truly believe that um and i, I think it's why the majority of your responses were yes you felt you could advocate for your client because i think it is the social workers in the system who are the ones who are doing that and i i will say i'll just circle back a little bit to the to the times we hear from older adults who say, I really thought this social worker would be my advocate. And I'll say, well, you know, they, A, you don't always see that they are, may be advocating within the system um, for, on your behalf, because sometimes that's got to be done um, respectfully and, and uh, you know, it, it may not impact your case, but by virtue of the work that they're doing, it may make a change in the future. So let's not forget that. And I think, what it tells me is, and, and many of you, I'm sure, uh, you know, are, are already doing this, but what it tells me is about the importance of being um, completely transparent and honest with with the client, um, you know, letting them know what you can and cannot do and ensuring that they understand that, ensuring that they understand that, look, this is this is not an area that I can change or make a difference. I appreciate that it's it's an area you're concerned about. It's not meeting your need, but this is our policy, and it's how it is, and I can't change it. And so that that honesty in, uh, up front, um, I always found that uh, even some of the hardest information uh, that you think is going to negatively impact your relationship with your client is much better said up front and honestly. Um, in in the front end than them hearing it in the back end um and and usually will actually uh, make it such that your um your working relationship is, is stronger and better so um that is it for the presentation i've uh, i will just say I talked about we're on social media, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. You can certainly follow us. You can pass that along to your uh, to your clients if they'd like to follow us. We also have a newsletter um, that's on our website. We have a website. We try to keep it up to date. And now we'll move into questions. So we now get you. Yep, turn the camera back on. Thank you. And uh, happy yeah. today. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this excellent uh, presentation, Susan. Oh, my goodness. It was wonderful uh, to hear about uh, the work of the office and everything that's happening and also the issues that are impacting on seniors in the province. Uh, so we do have a couple questions that come in that has come in and uh, we do have time for other uh, people to get their questions in. But one of the questions we received is, has there been a recommendation made to review the current home support services assessment and reassessment guidelines? Did any recommendations come up uh, pertaining to that? Yes. So in our most recent report, we released um, the um, the one that I had on the screen there, uh, What Golden Years. Within that, we've made specific recommendations to change the guidelines, uh, those, those home support, uh, community support guidelines, uh, such that uh, seniors in receipt of the senior supplement in this province would be automatically eligible. They would not have a copay. That uh, seniors in receipt of GIS 
also, we recommended them separately that they also wouldn't have a copay. So as it stands now, if you're on income support, you pay, everyone in the province pays copay. But if you're on income support, you don't pay a copay. But the day you turn 65, you do, uh, which, you know, is, is it doesn't make sense at all. So we recommended that. But in addition to that, we have asked for a full review of those guidelines. Yes, that's, so that's in, if, if uh, who, the person who asked the question, if you want to look at our walk going years report, that actually is in there as a recommendation and a couple of others as it relates to home support. Perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, another question that we received was uh, during the consultation process, did anyone in the consultation, uh, consultations mention the less than adequate comfort allowance of 150 per month for seniors living in long-term care and board and lodging agreements? And that, that came up in, through your consultations. It did, yeah. Um, it absolutely did. And in fact, we, we're still getting it. It was only this week that we received an email from a gentleman saying, you know, he cannot believe that what seniors are expected to live on in terms of the comfort allowance. Uh, it absolutely did. We haven't made a specific recommendation around it uh, for two reasons. Reason one, we called for the review of the long-term care and personal care home system, and government is doing it. Uh, we called for a committee of stakeholders um, in the province to help um, be involved in, uh, engaged in that review. And so many other organizations, including my own, Alzheimer's Society, Parkinson's Society, there's numerous organizations on it. Uh, so we're all engaged in that. And so I feel that um, that hopefully will be part of an outcome of improvements to the system. Um, so I haven't made a specific recommendation yet. I'm waiting for that, that review to come, like the recommendations, the outcome of that review to of those two systems to come out. I did raise it um, with the Department of CSSD as it relates to the poverty reduction strategy, uh, because I think at this point it would be fair given some of the changes they've made in, in the uh, current programs. Excellent, thank you. Uh, you just men mentioned the long-term care and personal home care, home care review. Uh, someone's wondering if the seniors advocate will be involved in that review and providing input into that consultation process. Yeah, so so we called for that to be an external review because it really needed expertise in the area of um, residential care. And so um, we're pleased that the lead person for the review is an external person. Um, the other two are health authority um, employees, uh, but they do have a lot of experience and expertise in the area. So, you know, that's great. So that's moving forward. They've hired a, a firm to help them to do the work. Um, and so then, we have a committee that uh, is provided certain aspects of the information to have input into. And so um, I, I thought that was very important versus it just being my office, because as I said, you know, we're a small little office and there's a lot of groups out there that service um, and have expertise around uh, the needs of, for example, people with Alzheimer's in the long-term care system. So, you know, the Alzheimer's Society is, is represented, just use them as an example. So it does, so that committee is engaged we have had opportunity, for example, to inform, inform the surveys that have recently been made public um, and some of the aspects uh, as this moves forward. We are not a decision making body. We do not you know, have final say or any of those kind of things, but we do get an opportunity to provide some input. As an office, of course, uh, I have um, ability once the uh, report is released and the recommendations to, uh, you know, review that and, and make any recommendations or comments that I wish to, and we certainly will. Uh, and a follow-up question just came in around that in terms of, from your knowledge, uh, will the community or people with lived experience be involved in those consultations? Um, so uh, yes, but the degree to which I can't really specifically say, I, I know that uh, there were uh, some consultations held in personal care homes and long-term care facilities in the province. So we know that some uh, uh, homes were visited and some people were able to attend. I, I, I'm not 
like I don't know the details. Um, and then of course the survey is online. So um, and and I do believe there's there is not I do believe there is some um, uh, specific focus groups being held, but the degree to which um, actual um, uh, you know, individuals are part of those sorts of focus groups. I'm unsure. I, I, I can't answer that specifically. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's that's good. Thank you. Um, another question that we had come in was around your thoughts on the basic income pilot for older adults younger than 65 in the province's poverty reduction strategy. I think it's fabulous. I mean, I, th I think the concept is really great. I haven't been engaged or uh, involved in, you know, the model, so I can't, I can't comment on the model if it's good, bad, or indifferent, but the concept of uh, basic income, certainly support as an office. We know that many, many, many seniors who come off of income support and move into, um, you know, the federal benefits, the OAS, GIS, they struggle. They struggle because the way the system is built in the income support system often supports them better, uh, you know, uh, to meet their needs. And I'm talking very low income seniors who may have particular challenges. And so we know, like we've heard from Stella Circle, for example, that a lot of seniors often will lose their housing when they transfer, uh, you know, become 65 and transfer in into the benefits because they hadn't been used to paying their rent. And now all of a sudden they got to pay their rent. They, they're getting their income uh, once a month and, they, and, you know, it's all new to them. So I think I think the model will help people transition better. Um, and I think that um, the needs of this group I know in this province there are many, many people struggling. The cost of living is so significant. Um, but I always say seniors are the group who have the least amount of ability to gain income in any other way. You know, like some may take a second job. That's not what we'd like to see, but some do. Some may uh, be able to take, you know, partial work and sup to supplement their income support. But older adults, they don't have, they have, very limited. Uh, they're on fixed incomes and that's that. And so um, I think this pilot will be a great exercise to see if this really A, helps that group and helps them transition into uh, the 65 plus range when the federal government really, for the most part, takes over. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and another question that we had, and I'll try to uh, sum it up, I guess, uh, in terms of the data that was initially collected when you were doing the online consultations and the sur and the in-person uh, consultations with regards to the data that was collected and uh, how re other researchers are looking for that, that information, that data. Can you just explain how that information was shared and what data has, um, or information that, I guess, themes from the data that were shared pertaining to that, how that process went? Yeah, so, so because the survey was all uh, online, um, you know, it, we could roll it up. And the survey was expensive. It was, it took a, a 30 to 45 minutes minimally to complete. And if you, you know, wanted to put more detail, it would take longer. I used to joke and say, you know, sit down with a glass of wine or a cup of tea, whatever, you know, and please do my survey, I used to keep saying. And so, you know, it's a lot of information. And so we actually had to hire a firm. We don't have the resources here to help with developing it online and then helping us do the analysis to roll it up and so mql was invaluable to us and uh, so we have all of that um and we we're, you know, we use excel as our um as our platform for to be able to do analysis of it and um my greatest wish would be that we'd have one extra position here that uh, could do some of that uh, data analysis and review because, man, what a difference it could make to uh, really strong uh, supportive uh, research and recommendations. But anyway, so all that data is there. So we've got uh, support. We've got uh, research across the country, A, trying to figure out how did you get all these people to respond, especially seniors and online and all of that, and then B, Gee, it'd be great if we could access your data because it, tell, it would tell us information about their needs and 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 you know what's impacting them and what they see as the solutions and because that's all in there. Um, but I mean, we haven't gone that road yet. I mean, I'm not to say that we you know it could be an option in the future, but we are 
more from an office perspective of wanting to get inside of it ourselves. And so we used it from the perspective of picking what area we would focus on currently. We we want our we want our all of our work here to be informed by the research and the data and and that being informed by what seniors are telling us and the and the research that's out there and and so uh, that will be our next step. We will use this to have a good hard look at okay. What else? Where else should we focus now as an office? I don't know, Annette, if that is there anything specific in that question I didn't. Uh, no, that's great. Thank you so much, uh, Susan. Yeah. Yep. Um, another, uh, we're almost out of time, but uh, another question uh, is uh, just around in terms of what would you describe as your most rewarding uh, experience in terms of being the seniors uh, advocate for the province? Wow, that's a <laughs> that's a that's a great and difficult question. Uh, okay, so in the first instance, being able to get back to being a social worker has been it's it's a uh, it's it's a privilege that I didn't think I would have in my career before I retired. To be frank, I mean, I'm not saying I haven't been a social worker my whole career. I have, I have, I've been practicing social worker. But sometimes when you get at that management and executive level, you don't feel it's close to it. You don't feel like you're having the ability to have the impact uh, and see that impact in the way you'd like to. So this has been a real privilege to me. Um, but it comes with a real responsibility, making sure you're making a difference, wanting this office to really um, help in the way it was envisioned to do so. And so um, what's I, I'll be honest, the most rewarding aspect for me so far in this in this position has been how seniors have engaged. I mean, it's shocking. I can't tell you. We already have, I'd say, over 15 communities already looking for us to come out and speak to the seniors in their community in the spring like what they are and they come out in droves and they want to have a say and and just seeing it on their faces like they'll say things like you know we didn't have a voice no one's listening and now it's like okay you know we got someone who's listening to us who's putting forward our issues and I, don't get me wrong, I'm still very clearly, and so are the great staff I have here, very, I mean, who do this every day, working with seniors to help them advocate for themselves, because that's where it's at. But when you really think about it, it's really hard at any age as an individual to make systemic change, to see change at that level. And I mean, my background as a social worker has been in social policy. I mean, my master's was specific to policy. And you think sometimes, I always thought being inside a government, I'd have so much ability to make those changes, but you're confined by so many things. And that's why I know it's a real challenge working inside the system. Um, it's liberating. It's so liberating to have that weight lifted off you. I can't tell you. It's great. So it's been very rewarding. Well, that was a wonderful way to uh, end our question and answer period. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Susan. Um, so there's no other questions that are that are coming in, and we're just about out of time. So I do want just to take a few moments to thank Susan for facilitating this excellent webinar for us today. And again, for sharing information about the advocates at the Seniors Advocates Office uh, in terms of the important work that's happening and how social workers can be, you know, become involved and highlighting the issues uh, impacting on seniors throughout the province. And regardless of one's area of practice of who's joining us today, we hope that this webinar spoke, sparked your interest in uh, policy and how as social workers, we do advocate to enhance the health and well-being uh, of seniors in our in our province. So thank you, Susan, for taking time from your busy schedule to facilitate this session for us today. It's truly, truly appreciate it. Uh, do want to note that RSWs may claim 1.5 CPE credits for attending this webinar today as part of the CPE policy. Uh, Susan's uh, presentation slide deck, the PDF of this is also available on the resource section on the webinar platform. Uh, for some of your re elective reading, you might also be interested in reviewing NLCSW's Health and Social Policy Advocacy Guideline document that you can also access on the webinar platform or under the Social Workers Menu um, option on the NLCSW website under Practice Support. Uh, so as you begin to sign off, please complete the evaluation that will appear on your screen as well. Your feedback is always so much greatly appreciated. 
And I just want to say on that note, thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. And Susan, I don't know if you wanted to say goodbye to everyone as well. Thank you, Annette. Yes, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for attending today and, and uh, for your questions and for all the work you do because it's critical to meeting the needs of people in the province and it's not easy work and I know that. And please feel free to contact our office at any time. We'd love to hear from you if there's anything we can do to help support the important work you're doing. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.